Howdy folks, hope you're all having a good one. Remember, the weekend begins here. And, well, actually does it. I mean, it certainly used to. But I suppose most people work six days a week now rather than five. So... Well, anyway, I hope you're all having a good one, whether your weekend begins here or not. And welcome back to World of Warships with Rear Admiral Jingles. Where today we are going to be entertained, and we are going to be entertained, by harnessing Ruin here, who just wants to be known as Ruin, which is fine, in the Japanese Tier 7 torpedo boat destroyer, the Akatsuki. There, you see, I can pronounce it properly, I just have to remember to not stress the U. Although it occurs to me that I could be falling victim to the same gag that all of the Germans pulled on me when I pronounced Gneisenau, Gneisenau, and didn't pronounce the G. And then a horde of angry Germans descended me in the comments saying, Seriously, Jingles, come on, we are Germans here. You don't think we put a letter in and expect you to not pronounce it. Which is a fair point. I mean, they're Germans after all. So I started calling it Gneisenau. At which point all the Germans said, Oh, Jingles, seriously, you're so funny. The G is silent. <laughs> and so... <laughs> Who says the Germans don't have a sense of humour? So anyway, I'm calling it a Katsuki, and I'm just waiting for everybody to tell me that I'm not pronouncing the U properly. Well, anyway, Ruin here, not a great player. Let's just make that clear right from the start. And he never claimed to be. He makes that very, very clear in the email that accompanied this replay. And that's fine, because as Dirty Harry very famously said in the movie Magnum Force, man's got to know his limitations. He's just like most of us, an average Joe, just trying to do his best and not make too many mistakes. Note that I did not say not make any mistakes, because for most of us that's impossible. Just not make too many mistakes. And honestly, for average players, that's kind of how you win battles. Try to minimise the number of mistakes that you make, and jump all over any mistakes that the enemy make. Anyway, tier 8 battle, domination match here on the Shards map, so he's not top tier. He's not in the team's stealthiest destroyer, that particular honour goes to the Shinonomi, but he does still have better stealth than the Sims and the Lightning on the enemy team. I'm not sure if he has better or the same stealth as the Fubuki. Either way, he's in a stealthy destroyer, so he's doing the responsible thing, and he's going for the cap, and he is actually capturing uncontested, so that's good. Sadly, the Akatsuki has... Um, how can I put this? It has something in common with most Tier 7 destroyers. It's just not very good. Tier 7 is just not a great place to be if you're a destroyer captain, because with the single exception of the Leningrad, which is a premium, I don't think there is a single Tier 7 destroyer in the game that you would call good. They're all either okay, or just downright bad. And the Akatsuki kind of just hovers on the okay side of that split, but it's almost bad. Oh hang on, he's spotted. That's not good. He is, however, successful in capping, so mission accomplished. Now, who could there be spotting him here? Now, this is where he makes his first kind of mistake, because lurking around in front of enemy guns while you've been detected, although nobody is targeting him, so he's getting away with it. Wait, no, don't move forward, you... Oh, dear, oh, dear, oh, dear. So, yeah, those are submarine torpedoes, which explains why he couldn't see who was spotting him. And, yeah, that was kind of stupid. But, like he said, he's not a great player. He's just an average Joe trying to do his best. Unfortunately, that mistake has cost him half of his health. He is, however, smart enough to understand... I mean, he's used his damage control to uh, mitigate the sonar ping. And there goes the smoke. And he's not lurking around inside the smoke screen because he is smart enough to understand that smoke screens are torpedo magnets. And he doesn't need to sit around inside the smoke screen because there's nothing there he can shoot at. There are no targets he can hit with his torpedoes. And he's already flipped the cap. So that smoke is just there to get him away from the submarine. And you'll note that the submarine isn't even flipping the cap. He's at too much of a... There he is. Still not flipping the cap, because he's submerged. Oh, I love this. This never stops being funny. You can see him. He's right there. He's visible on the map. He's within shooting range. Your guns are pointing at him, but you're not allowed to hit him. <laughs> Just when everybody said that playing against aircraft carriers was the most frustrating thing imaginable, Wargaming said, hold my vodka, and gave us submarines. Yes, I know, Akazuki. 
you wouldn't have thought it was possible for them to introduce a class of vessel into the game that was more frustrating to play against than aircraft carriers, but you can always rely on wargaming to come up with the goods. Well, anyway, the Akatsuki. Why do you say it's not a particularly good destroyer, Jingles? Oh, I thought you'd never ask. So, do you remember when, and this was a couple of years ago, so you could be easily forgiven if you don't, but do you remember when the Japanese destroyer line was split into gunboats and torpedo boats, with the torpedo boats culminating in the Shimakaze and the gunboats culminating in the Harugabo? The Akatsuki is the tier 7 entry in the torpedo boat line of Japanese destroyers, and you can tell that it's the torpedo boat because, and I'm not making this up, it has exactly one more torpedo than the tier 7 gunboat, the Shiratsuyu. But it doesn't get the Shiratsuyu's torpedo reload booster. <laughs> and it has better guns than the Shiratsuyu. <laughs> Yeah, it's got better guns than the gunboat, and arguably worse torpedoes than the gunboat. Uh, note that I'm not saying it has good guns, it doesn't, the guns are kind of bad. But they're better than the gunboat's guns. <laughs> <laughs> oh, all gaming. Never change. Oh, here we go. I mean, he keeps insisting that he's not a particularly good player, but he predicted the Fubuki's intentions perfectly, and he played that one well. I mean, you could argue that he didn't need to use the torpedoes. And as it turned out, he didn't need to use the torpedoes, but what if he'd missed? He would have had to spend the next seven and a half seconds reloading, during which time the Fubuki would have been continuing to shoot at him, could have gotten its own torpedoes away, and anybody that the Fubuki was spotting him for would have been swinging its own gun barrels around and pointing them in this direction. And so, yeah, sure, he didn't end up needing to have used the torpedoes, but, well, there's nothing else over here that he could use the torpedoes on anyway, and if those guns had missed, there's at least a chance that the torpedoes could have taken the Fubuki out before his guns had reloaded. So, yeah, technically, didn't need to use them. But they were a backup for the guns in case the guns missed, and it's all about minimising the potential that any mistakes you make are going to get you killed. Meanwhile... The team ain't doing too well. They're down by one kill, but they're also down by one cap. And whether Ruin realises it or not, and it's entirely possible that he doesn't, but he is now the most stealthy ship in this match. The team have lost the Shinonomi, and he just killed the enemy Fubuki. I'll tell you something else that's nice to see. With a carrier in play, he's turned his AA guns off. Now you do that by pressing P, it disables your secondaries and your anti-aircraft guns. And the reason he'd want to do it in a stealthy destroyer like the Akatsuki, is it has an air detectability range of only 3.02 kilometers, but its AA guns can fire out to a range of 5.01 kilometers, and that will get you spotted from the air when you might otherwise have avoided it by just going stealthy and deactivating the AA guns. Another thing that's nice to see is that he is heading in the direction of the enemy cap circles, but he's doing it via the U-69 who's behind those islands and threatening the carrier. The Megami is also coming to the carrier's defence. He's just launched uh, strike aircraft with death charges. But I'm not seeing any dead submarines, so it obviously wasn't successful. Now, if he goes after that submarine directly, it is going to be very risky, because the Egan now and Eendracht over there... I mean, if the sub's deep enough, it's not going to counter-detect him, and he can safely death charge it, without being spotted. But if the sub is not deep enough, he's going to be in open water in front of an Eendracht's main battery guns, and not only a Gneisenau's main battery guns, which, let's face it, they're kind of not that much of a threat against something as small and fast as a destroyer, but depending on how the Gneisenau captain is set up, he could be within range of the Gneisenau's secondaries. And he doesn't have an awful lot of health left, so... yeah. He's not going after the U-69, tempting though it may be. How are those torpedoes looking? I think they've all missed. No. One hit on the Indracht. Nothing on the Gneiser now. Yeah. Well, the hit's a hit. And because he's launched them so long ago, they're ready to go again. I think we're seeing Megami torpedoes over there as well. The Megami actually has a pretty nasty torpedo loadout. 
The only problem is the awful firing angles that um, expose way too much broadside on a very, very badly armoured cruiser to make it comfortable using them. But if it can get them away, they've got good range and they hit really hard. And it can launch a lot of them. Okay, it looks like the carrier's made it. The Megami, however, is definitely attracting a lot of fire. And, um, you know, I suppose that's kind of good. Because it means nobody's pointing their guns at Ruin. Now, I was about to say that was not a great place to stop and smoke up. And I'm going to stay with that because at the point where he did it, it was not a good place. I'll explain why later. But that's when the U-69 popped up and he was able to get some shots off. Including setting a fire, although he has damage control. And gets the kill on the Eendracht <laughs> with the torpedoes that he launched earlier. He kept the torpedo launcher ready, and he saved that for the Gnizer now. The reason I say that was not a great place to stop and smoke up was because at the time he didn't know the U-69 was there, okay? And it meant that, yes, sure, he got like one salvo off against the Gnizer now, but then the island's in the way, so he couldn't shoot at the Gnizer now, he couldn't shoot at the Eendracht. Fortunately, right at the moment that he did it, the U-69 popped up. He got some shots off at it, wasn't able to sink it, but then the Gnizer now, who just got shot at by an extremely angry looking smoke screen, and witnessed his accompanying cruiser die to torpedoes launched from the source of this very angry smoke screen, and was in cover from torpedoes behind the island, for some bizarre reason thought it would be a good idea to sail out into a position where he could again get torpedoed. So I maintain that smoking up there was not the smartest thing to do. I'm not saying it was a bad thing to do, but the smoke could have been used better. In fact, it probably didn't even need to be used at all. And yet, at the same time, it still ended up working out very well for him. And once again, the torpedoes are back up, and there is a Miyoko just in range. Yes, I know it's an hour, but... <laughs> The torpedoes are never going to get there in time, of course. But the Alba isn't even aiming at him, and he's given a nice flat broadside, so he's... Oh, wow. Oh, it was the... Well, you see, that's what you get for looking after your carrier. The Alba got to experience the joys of being shat on by the fun police as well. Oh, hang on a second, he's pinged. Oh, yes, the U-69's still around here somewhere, isn't he? Oh, quickly, regarding that Alba, he was doomed anyway. He was sailing flat broadside against a Megami firing armor piercing at a range of about six kilometers. So, yeah, there was no way he was ever surviving that, regardless of whether or not the carrier got involved. So, he's used his damage control. He's got, oh, there he is. I don't think, I mean, you know, he's going to take the shots anyway, but I think the U 69 is just going to make it. Yeah, he can't, yeah he's. Notice the X next to his name, you're not allowed to shoot at him. <laughs> so even if he had uh, enough lead, it still wouldn't have done any damage to the sub. However, he knows where he's going. He's heading for that cap circle, isn't he? The U-69 is trying to flip the cap. And if he's trying to flip the cap, he's going to be vulnerable. Wargaming were at least smart enough, and he is trying to flip the cap. But yeah, Wargaming were at least smart enough to not give submarines the ability to flip capture circles while remaining invulnerable. So, there's that. Not quite sure what that is zipping across the screen over there. Oh, there he is. Oh, hello! He's going to dive, of course. But he's not going to be able to stay dived, because he's got zero oxygen left. There was a time when submarines would just do what they call porpoising, where they would be visible, they would dive, even if they had no oxygen, and then they would be forced to come straight back up, but then they would just dive again, and it was impossible to hit them. And they could keep doing that forever. So they did at least patch that shit out, because that, you know, never got annoying, did it? I'm not sure about the value of the torpedoes there either, but hey, at the end of the day, the submarine's dead, the cat is secure. Although, you are still 200 points behind. Although you do have two cap circles now. So, good job. Who was that who flipped it? Oh, it was those guys over there. The Helena, the Flint, and the uh, U-190. It was a team effort. Good job. 
Well, since Ruben had to come over here to deal with the U69 and defend this cap circle, it's going to be a while before he's in position to actually do anything else. I felt now would be, well, not the best time, because I probably should have commented on it right at the beginning of the battle when it was happening, but there was some rather amusing chat going on. The friendly U69 was saying he hates carriers when he's playing a sub. The Megami said he hates carriers when he's playing any ship. <laughs> Yeah, I think we can all sympathise with the Megami there. Ruin then gave what I think is probably the best advice anybody has ever given in team chat during the match of World of Warships. It's easy, just don't play carriers or subs. And um, <laughs> yeah, imagine how much more fun the game would be for everybody if more people took that advice. Oh, there have just been a couple of casualties. Both teams just lost a ship. They still haven't won this, by the way. Even though they do have both a kill and a cap advantage, the enemy team are still about 130 points ahead. The thing is, I don't think you can really accuse the enemy team of trying to win harder at this point because there's still four minutes of the game left and if they don't get some more kills or flip one of the caps, they will lose. And with the Indianapolis and the Megami involved in a gunfight that could go either way, they might still get that kill. And the enemy Baltimore just popped up and he's shooting at the Megami as well. So the Megami is almost certainly going to die, but they might be able to get the Indianapolis, in which case it will be a points neutral exchange. The carrier's going for him with rockets. Can they do it? They're about, yep, there goes the Megami, but the carrier did get the Indianapolis. So that's a points neutral exchange, a cruiser for a cruiser. It's not ideal. They needed to kill the Indianapolis without losing the Megami, but I think the second the Baltimore over there popped up, there was no chance of that happening. The clock is ticking down though, and the enemy team are still 100 points ahead. They may still be able to win this on points. Harness in ruin. Two torpedo launchers expended against the Baltimore, who is now in a hard turn, so all of those torpedoes are going to miss, but he has saved one torpedo launcher, and he's waited until the Baltimore has corrected its course. So that was good to see. However, he is doing something very, very dangerous here. He is stopping and smoking up within radar range of a Baltimore. The Baltimore is, of course, a radar cruiser. But again, circumstances conspire to keep him safe because it appears that the Baltimore is out of radar charges. It's also nice to see that he's had the foresight to switch to armor piercing, which is going to do more damage than HE would against a broadsiding cruiser. But again, he didn't need to alert the Baltimore to the presence of an enemy destroyer by smoking up and shooting because the third set of torpedoes that he launched have earned him the Kraken Unleashed. Unfortunately, the Baltimore had shots in the air, and again it's a points neutral exchange because he's taken out the flint and earned himself the Flesh Wound Award. That just leaves the enemy lightning in that extremely suspicious looking smoke screen over there. He's going for the kill on the submarine. Switch to the high explosive. And these guns do hit very hard, but it's the U-190 who gets the kill against the class of vessel that's supposed to be the hard counter to submarines. <laughs> and, uh, and that's a victory. So, yeah, I think we can safely say mistakes were made. <laughs> of course they were. He's just an average Joe like the vast majority of us. But none of those mistakes were fatal. And he also made some good decisions and he capitalised on the mistakes made by the enemy. And honestly, for most of us, that's what wins battles. So, I hope you enjoyed today's video, and I hope for all the other average Joes out there, it's given you some hope for the future. As always, take care, stay safe, and I'll catch you next time.